we represent compounds with chemical formulas, sort of a shorthand. And the formula is going to represent the elements that are present and indicate the relative number of atoms of each of them. So we use a subscript um, after each element symbol to tell how many atoms of that element. So for water, we have H2O. That means there's two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. For carbon tetrachloride, the formula is CCl4. So one carbon and four chlorines. Now, CCl4 is sometimes mistaken um, because this CL, a lowercase l, looks a lot like the number one and a lot like a capital I. Um, and so sometimes those students will think that this is a capital I. But then you'd have two carbons and four iodines, and if we meant that, we'd write C2I4. Because we don't, we don't indicate two carbons by just writing the symbol twice. And, and so that's a clue. Unfortunately, the font on my PowerPoint slides has the L's and the capital I's looking the same. There are different types of chemical formulas. An empirical formula gives us the relative number of atoms. It's the lowest ratio. Empirical is a word that means from experiment. This is something that's determined experimentally. A molecular formula tells us the actual number of atoms in a molecule. So for C4H8, one molecule contains four carbons and eight hydrogens. That's the molecular formula. But the lowest ratio of four to eight is one to two. So this is the empirical formula. The empirical formula is like simplifying a fraction. So think back to elementary school when you learned about fractions. And four-eighths, they'd want you to simplify that to one-half. So the empirical formula is the lowest fraction, the simplest ratio. The molecular formula tells us how many atoms are actually in a molecule. So for B2H6, that describes the molecule. The empirical formula, though, is BH3. Uh, for CCL4, that describes a molecule, one carbon atom, four chlorine atoms bonded together. That is also the empirical formula. They're the same because here the ratio 1 to 4 cannot be simplified. Any questions? Yes? Why simplify it? Um, usually we don't bother simplifying from a molecular formula to an empirical formula. What usually happens is an empirical formula is determined by experiment, and then we have to go through some effort to find out what the actual molecular formula is. Um, at this point, I think the book is just trying to emphasize that we understand what the difference between an empirical and a molecular formula are. Another type of formula is a structural formula. Um, here, we're going to use lines to represent covalent bonds, and this is going to show us how the atoms are connected, what order they're connected in. So here's a structural formula for hydrogen peroxide, H2O2. This shows that the one hydrogen is bonded to this oxygen, which is bonded to another oxygen, and that one's bonded to the other hydrogen. Now, using your imagination, you could connect two O's and two H's in lots of different ways, right? We could make a circle. Well, I guess it's a diamond. You know, not understanding anything about how hydrogen and oxygen bond, we could, we could imagine all, other, all kinds of other things, right? We could connect them in different ways. And with some compounds, there are other ways of connecting the atoms that would give you a different compound. It turns out neither of these exists. They, they're just not possible. But this tells us how they're connected. 
In empirical formulas, we use, a, I'm sorry, in structural formulas, we use a single line for single bonds, a double line for double bonds, and a triple line for triple bonds. So if we had double bonds, we would draw it like this with double lines. So two lines means a double bond. And we'll learn more about those later as well. Yes? So um, we, we don't use structural formulas for ionic compounds. We only use them for covalent compounds. Yes, question? So why do we only use them for covalent? Um, we'll kind of get to that. In, in an ionic compound, um, the ions are going to arrange themselves to be alternating positive, negative. And so there's not really lots of different ways that they can be connected. And there's also not any discrete molecules in an ionic compound. But in a molecular compound, there are discrete molecules. And the atoms could be combined in different ways. I think, I hope that that um, idea will become a little clearer. If it doesn't make sense by the time we get through all this formula business, ask me again, OK? So why do we have these different formulas? They have different amounts of information, and so um, they are convenient in different situations. The empirical formula um, gives us the least amount of information. Um, we don't generally use empirical formulas very much. Um, the molecular formula is probably the one that we use most frequently because it's very compact and concise and gives us the information that we need most of the time. The structural information gives us more information. So you won't be tested on the empirical formula? We, we won't be. What I will ask you is, if this is the molecular formula, what's the empirical formula? And we're going to learn how to calculate the empirical formula from data. But aside from that, we won't use empirical formulas very much. So let's write empirical formulas for these compounds. So C5H12. What we're doing is we're looking at the ratio of the subscripts. Can 5 to 12 be simplified? No, there's no common factor. So here, the empirical formula is the same as the molecular formula. How about this one, HG2Cl2? Just HGCl. That's the lowest ratio. How about C2H4O2? CH2O. We can take each of these subscripts and divide it by 2. And so the lowest ratio is 1 to 2 to 1. Any questions? Yes? Um, some of the uh, empirical formulas, are, as compared to the molecular, molecular formulas, mm -hmm. do the empirical versions like not exist sometimes? Or can That's a good exist? question. So empirical and molecular formulas do the empirical formulas not actually exist sometimes? Right. That is very true. Um, I mentioned hydrogen peroxide earlier. This is hydrogen peroxide, H2O2. That is a compound that exists. The empirical formula for that would be HO. But there is no molecule that is consisting of just one hydrogen and one oxygen. It's not stable. And it, it, it just doesn't exist. Yeah, good so question. Would that apply to HG, HG2 plus? Would that apply to this? Yeah. Um, this one actually can exist, and this one's a little bit tricky. These are both ionic compounds, um, and the first one is going to be this weird diatomic ion that mercury makes, and it's going to have two chloride ions. And this other one is going to be mercury 1, I'm sorry, mercury 2, um, with, with chloride. 
No, it isn't. Sorry. This would be Mercury plus. Yeah, so that is correct. HGCl doesn't exist. I would not expect you to know that, though, because I kind of had a brain fart about it just now. Any other questions? We also use models to describe molecules. Um, I'm a very visual learner. I need to be able to see things. Um, and if I can't see actual objects, I need to be able to paint pictures in my mind. And I think a lot of people learn at least partially by seeing things. And so models help us to visualize something that's too small for us to see. Um, there are different types of models. Uh, a ball and stick model is very useful. This uses um, balls to represent the atoms, and then the sticks represent the chemical bonds. And we have some of these kits, and we'll be using them later in the semester. Um, we've kind of agreed on colors for each element. Um, these are not universal, but they're pretty much um, commonly used. And if you remember looking at oxygen and hydrogen in the book, the, the hydrogen atoms are always little white circles, and the oxygen are red circles. And using the same colors all the time just even helps more with the visualization because you don't have to look up, oh, what is that atom? Oh, it's carbon because it's black. You don't need to memorize those colors. Another type of model is a space filling model. And here's an example of a space filling model. This is more like what a molecule would really look like if we could see them. Um, it would not look like five separate balls connected with sticks. It's not really going to look like that. It would look more like this kind of lumpy thing here. So these are useful for some purposes, but the ball and stick model is more useful for other purposes. And then we have structural formulas and molecular formulas. So the space filling model, we would have been felt as a double bond or triple bond, right? Right. With a space filling model, it's going to be hard to see if there's a double or triple bond. Exactly. And when you get into a larger molecule, you're not going to be able to see what's on the back side. And so you're really going to have to have it in front of you so that you can turn it around and look at it. Um, so in terms of seeing complicated connections, the ball and stick model is better because it spreads things out. It's easier to see how things are connected. Here's a table from your book giving examples of each of these types of descriptions for different compounds. If we look at this one down here, glucose. Um, so here's the ball and stick model. And you can tell that it's easier to see how many white and red and black balls there are than in the space filling model, where it kind of just looks like a funky caterpillar or something. Any questions? We just need to be familiar with all of them, because we will encounter all of these things. <clears throat>